I remember it's going to be a story about people's temple. So what the people see on the film, and you do it right now, and what the film is, what they're going to have an impression of is the temple. So right now, you're representing all of us. You're representing Jim. You're representing principal. Peace, love, and brotherhood. Every now and then I treat myself by spinning the rarest record in my vinyl collection, an old gospel funk album printed in 1973 called He's Able by The People's Temple. It was the only commercially released album by The People's Temple and apparently hard to find. I received it as a gift and much to the dismay and shock of my friend, I could not wait to unwrap it. I was holding history in my hands a snapshot in wax etched nearly 50 years ago. As I lowered the stylus and listened, I felt as though I was hearing these songs for the first time. The warmth of the bass, those deep analog tones, the gloriously designed stereo image finally free and in high fidelity. Music is an emotional language that can transport the listener to another time or place, conveying ideas and feelings words simply cannot. Welcome back to Transmissions from Jonestown. You're listening to episode 17, He's Able. Listening to He's Able, you can easily imagine visiting a temple service for the first time. The funky mix of spirituals, original songs, and 60s hits creates a diverse listening experience that is remarkably inclusive and inviting. The album opens with the children's choir, their voices proclaiming their hearts are filled with song because he is always near. The song welcomes you and sets the tone for the rest of the album. What follows is a variety of songs representing just a fraction of the talent and creativity possessed by temple members. The song choices themselves, designed to showcase the temple's talents and the social message flow as if to tell the story of a movement. If you listen carefully, you can feel the hope and optimism in the voices on the album, as the lyrics express their struggles to free the oppressed and find purpose in this life. There are references to the Father, but the significance and meaning differ slightly from other Christian music, giving the old standards new meaning. The album ends with a question, Will You? A song about sharing brotherhood, and changing the world. Maybe more than anything else the temple left behind, He's Able reflects the way the People's Temple saw themselves. The altruistic message of equality expressed on the album, the optimism and high energy of the singers, juxtaposes what we know will be their eventual fate. Yet in that moment in 1973, now etched in vinyl, the temple's future is not yet set, and the dreamers still believe. And you can hear it. This is the story behind the making of He's Able. One, two, three. One day, not so long ago, Mike Wood found himself on Hollywood Boulevard taking a stroll down memory lane. 
He'd spent hours recording tracks for He's Able at the producer's workshop nearly 50 years ago when the temple was his life. I had an office in Beverly Hills and one in San Francisco. I would go to Beverly Hills every other week for a couple of days. In the evenings, I really enjoyed walking around the town. I fell in love with West LA. And one evening, I decided it might be kind of fun to walk over to Hollywood Boulevard and see if the old producer's studio was still there. And the producer's studio, of course, was where we recorded He's Able. And that was a memorable experience in and of itself. So I walked over to the old location, and sure enough, the building is still there, but it's now called the Hollywood Museum of Death. And for those of you interested in Hollywood, you'll want to know that the Hollywood Museum of Death is just around the corner from the Hollywood Museum of Broken Relationships. Anyway, back to the Museum of Death. So I thought, well, I wonder if they have any connection to the producer's workshop. So I walked in and was greeted by exactly the kind of young, heavily tattooed, uh, heavy metal, dyed black hair kids who were essentially there as curators and docents ushering people around the Museum of Death. I did not at that time think that the Museum of Death would have anything related to People's Temple at all. I was just curious about the museum's connection to the producer's uh, workshop. So I introduced myself to one of the young staff people uh, and and explained what my connection to People's Temple was and that I recorded the He's Able album um, as one of the musicians. And he really jumped at it and he said, oh my God, we have a whole segment devoted to People's Temple and we are very interested to speak with anyone who is connected to He's Able because we've talked a lot about it, we've been told a lot about it because the producer's workshop still exists, it's just in the back of the building, not in the front of the building anymore. And as we were talking, a number of the other staff people came over to chat and asked me questions. It must have been quite amusing to other people who were attending the museum just as visitors because here I am, (laughs) this older white male who has in thrall all these young gothic kids. And I was really bemused by that. But they were very sincere and very polite. And one of them said, oh my gosh, we have the album. Would you, would you sign it for us? Would you autograph it for us? I said, look, I was just a bandsman. I played the tenor sax. I wasn't the choir director. I said, we don't care. You're on it. We really would like you to sign it for us. And I said, well, if you insist, I'll sign it. And so I did. And they escorted me around the museum and showed me the wall devoted to uh, He's Abel and People's Temple and asked me all the questions you might expect that someone would have who was interested in the subject but didn't really know much about it. And it was a really kind of a fun experience. And they were so polite. I was just shocked because I was expecting, I guess, that people who uh, dress in the goth bat would be uh, sort of angry young people. But in no way. They were just incredible kids. And uh, it was a a wonderful experience. I, 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 I so enjoyed it. Long before He's Able hung on the walls in the suicide hall of the Museum of Death, It was sold at merchandise stands during temple services, displayed among pictures of Jim Jones, anointed prayer cloths, and handmade crafts. He's Able sold thousands of copies wherever temple buses carried them throughout the United States. It was the soundtrack of the movement, a movement that depended heavily on music to convey its culture and message to the public. Music for the temple was like a soul for the body. Without it, temple services would have been lifeless cold affairs. But like a soul, you cannot separate the music from the temple's body or its history, no matter how positive the funky vibes. Even as we hum along or tap our toes, subtle nuances in the lyrics raise the hairs on the back of our necks, reminding us that most of the people who made the album died in Jonestown. For Mike Wood, 
the time he spent at the producer's workshop moonlighting as a sax player was a welcome break from his hectic schedule and stresses of everyday temple life. Music played an important role in both Mike's life and the temple's history. It's true, you never knew you could live in the heaven today. Live with God in a body who's really brainy, having his way. Jim was a good singer. Jim had a good voice. Marshall had a good voice. And they came from a Pentecostal tradition. And there's always a lot of singing in the Pentecostal churches. Plus, you know, they were appealing to the black community. And if you know anything about black spirituality, it is, you know, at its core is a musical testimony and uh, the musical experience. You know, you name the artist and they started out in their church choir. I mean, because, and it was a, it was really kind of an, a, an emotional thing. So it was just part of our experience. I'm glad we have each other. When trials come, you know how much you need each other. You know how much you need the body of Christ. That's why I sing, nobody knows. I've never sung that publicly, but it kind of rang in my heart because I love you. So we'll sing to each other and be glad, no matter how much trouble we have, at the end we'll sing glory, hallelujah. Mm, sing it again. Nobody knows, but I love it. I used to sing it when I was a child, when it was poor and cold, you know. Nobody knows the trouble. Many of our members, particularly member of choir members, had come from the black spiritual experience and had developed their musical talent there and then brought it to the temple. And our choir was certainly a reflection of that. It gave it a real added dimension uh, in terms of its musicality. And in terms of recruitment, the choir was, of course, invited to sing all over the state. And uh, Jim, of course, conditioned our appearing on his being able to speak. And uh, that was fine with me. Uh, but we were... You know, we were traveling a lot on our own, independent of the church meetings. And it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Well, I'm a hard man, but a good father, because I'm not going to take care of anybody before I take care of you. Tomorrow, they came up to me and they said, our choir is supposed to sing at a Baptist church, they said. Said, your choir will be leaving at 2 o'clock. I said, who in the hell said it was? <laughs> you mean to tell me that I'm going to be here 2 o'clock tomorrow and all this choir going to decide to go to some Baptist church and I'm sitting here trying to get a message? No. There's only one way. I want to tell you. There's only one way that you go sing anywhere. If you do otherwise, you'll be out of your choir uniform tomorrow. The only way you can go is if they take me preaching first. <laughs> then I want to tell you, you better know some funeral anthems because when I get ready and finish, you'll have to bury them because they'll all be dead. So they tell me they got to get this bus with them, they're going to get this bus lined up, they're going to have that bus lined up. I said, where are you going? I said, the choir's going over tomorrow to sing at the Baptist church. I said, the hell they're going over to sing tomorrow. <laughs> oh, no. You think they're going to get my singing and use these people? You don't know how these churches, my people were innocent in. They don't know how they work it. They get all these choirs in, and then the preacher's collecting. And I, I said, I'll bet you there's some pastor. And sure enough, when they got behind it, the pastor's wife. And if you think that we worked and got this music together and sweat to build these organs for you to go to sing for some fat-ass preacher to make money off you, no! If they want to hear us sing, then let them come over and hear the light of the world. If they want to hear the beautiful singing, and we've got the most beautiful solos and the most beautiful choir, but if they want to hear them sing, let them first come over and hear the Rock of Ages. Former Temple member Laura Johnston Cole was in the choir and also recorded tracks for the album. Before she passed away, she recounted that her memories with the choir were amongst her most dear. She said, the music became the heart of the meetings and set the tone for the entire service, introducing the dynamic of People's Temple. Music unifies. It's a universal language. So music unifies. Also having people see their kids enthusiastically singing music and everything like that. It makes, you know, parents tears in their eyes and stuff. I mean, it's just heartwarming to see children involved in music and being enthusiastic. And also, you know, it brought some of our greatest 
most creative musicians and writers and authors. It gave them a venue that they could really express themselves way beyond the constraints of most churches. And so we had people who were just multi-talented musicians who were drawn in to perform and then, you know, could share their expertise around. So, I mean, in just many ways, music was a very important part of what was going on in people's trouble. And it was created because then, you know, once Jim changed the words of this an old, like, slave melodies and different things, somehow um, it had its own meaning within People's Temple because we changed the words to work for us. My own white companion was spit on with our black son, and she's been attempted to be driven off the road, and I suppose she's a typical prototype of blondness, and certainly she has a black heart. Peace. Peace. See, black heart's good here. We're changing some of that. That's why someone the other day heard us singing the song, What can make us black, our black to glow? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He said, Well, I never heard it that way. Well, we're changing things because black isn't bad, darling. Black is beautiful. You see, the old, the old uh, racist church, the old racist church, they want to talk about white as snow. Well, we want our black to glow. It's all right to be white as snow if you want to be. We want our black to glow. So we change a little words like that because we've got to re-educate. And there's been a lot of this fear of darkness back to primitive man that has caused black bad, dark, evil. This, this type of imagery of black being bad and white being good, we've got to change that around because we've found black to be very, very good and very, very beautiful. The lyrics to the songs, like the temple's beliefs, evolved and changed to fit the times. By updating old spirituals and augmenting popular hits, the temple's playlist had something for everyone, regardless of age. From the moment you walked into a temple service, the music created a certain atmosphere. The voices of the choir lifted the spirits of the congregants, electrifying the audience. Loretta Cordell, with her Hammond B3 organ, accompanied Jim Jones' often long sermons and set the tempo during faith healings. Without musical accompaniment, Jones' performances would have been far less effective and memorable. I was in Christ's temple one time. That's the biggest Pentecostal church in America. And they all said Jesus is coming soon. I was sitting down because I knew he hadn't gone anywhere. And they were all jumping up and shouting and saying, I'm ready. I want him to come. I hope it'll be morning. I want it to at least be noon. And I hope it won't be before the night. And they were shouting and they were screaming in Christ's temple. You remember about Christ's temple over there? Ah, yes. And I was there and I can tell you this for truth. Ah, about that time, over across the way, a big gas reservoir went boom. <laughs> And all those folks that were on their feet wanting Jesus to come, they all hit the floor and were down under the benches. They hid on the floor. They had the Holy Ghost. They'd been baptized in Jesus' name. They spoke in tongues. But they all were crawling on the floor. And I looked around and I was the only one sitting because I knew I didn't have to be afraid. I love the truth. I don't care if I have to die. I'd rather preach the truth than eat apple pie. I'd rather preach the truth than to have silver and gold when I die. I'd rather preach the truth. Say, they're going to come for you. I know they will. But when they come, they better get ready. Because there's going to be 10,000. <laughs> Loretta just basically played the organ or piano, and Jim really, Jim Jones, that is, I think I think it really helped him phrase his sermons and do the work that he felt he needed to do, and I recall she would play very softly these, uh, basically just kind of comping like somebody in a, in a band does when they're backing up a singer. There's not a real tune there, there's just interlinked chords, if you will, and she was very good at that, so it gave a depth to Jim's paranormal ministry that uh, made it even more impressive. Without it, it was a, his ministry was a little flat. Uh, so that was my experience with uh, Loretta. Now, as a person, uh, she was very quiet. She, when I knew her, she had had five children with Harold. She was never a vocal person in the church, and her role was really as, as the organist. 
and Harold was uh, one of Jim's close associates in those days. And they were uh, just a very nice family, I thought. My family has a history in music. For example, my grandfather, that is to say my mother's father, was a professional musician and swing era band leader in central Ohio. And my grandmother was, as a young woman, was a pianist and organist as accompanying silent movies in one of the major theaters in downtown Columbus. In fact, my grandfather and grandmother met each other in front of that theater. Both were waiting for their dates and their dates stood them up and they began talking with each other and six weeks later they were married. My grandfather had been uh, a doughboy in the First World War in the American Army as a musician uh, and served in France immediately after the war entertaining the troops who were still there and trying to get home. So my, my grandparents were musicians and my mother, Patty, was a a great singer. In fact, she fronted her father's band as a singer when she was only 11 or 12 years old. She had a great voice, something like uh, Kate Smith. She had a, a huge talent, actually, and could really knock out a tune whenever she wanted and loved loved being on the stage. That was my background. In fact, I inherited my grandfather's instruments. He was a sax and clarinet player, and I inherited them. And when I was nine years old, my mother gave them to me and uh, sent me off to to music lessons. And I had music lessons from someone, he was an older man at that time, who had known my grandfather and in fact had himself been a very famous musician, you know, now a hundred years ago or so. But so that was my introduction to music. And my mother, my mother had a great talent as a parent for making her goals for her children, their goals without their even thinking about it. So my mother, never really pushed me to be a musician, but she inspired me to be one. And it wasn't long before I actually picked up the ball with respect to becoming a musician and ran with it myself. And so I had music lessons, I had clarinet lessons and sax lessons and and piano lessons from the time I was nine years old until I was, oh my gosh, until I moved to California. I even taught music when I came to California. I gave private lessons. Uh, to a couple of folks. Growing up in Ohio, Mike's family was always on the move, rarely settling anywhere for more than a year at a time. His mother, Patty, a devout evangelical, encouraged and supported Mike's talents with what meager means his family had. Mike showed talent and played well, but still dreamed of being a musician and playing with a band. When Mike's family joined the temple, he was 12. Early on, he became close to Jim Jones and Jack Beam. Mike once said, like so many other Temple families, the Beams were a photo op for anyone wishing to depict the typical values-oriented Midwestern family. They had been in the Temple since its founding. Mike's earliest memories of anyone in the church, apart from Jim Jones, is Jack Beam Sr. One of my cherished friends in the church was Jack Beam, and I mean Jack L. Beam, Jack Sr. Jack was one of the great, great characters of, of <laughs> in the People's Temple. and. When I first uh, became a participant in People's Temple, Jack Sr. was one of the guys who I was closest to. Jack Sr. was really just a natural comedian. He was funny and could make anyone laugh and really lighten up a situation. Uh, And he had a great personality. He always reminded me of Nikita Khrushchev because they were about the same size and shape and they were both bald-headed. And as you may recall, uh, Nikita Khrushchev was the uh, chairman of the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union (laughs) during the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations uh, when I was uh, just a little boy. That was my first impression of Jack. But as soon as he opened his mouth, he, he was transformed because he had such a great persona and just the funniest jokes that you can imagine. And he could turn any situation into uh, uh, into a comedy. He was part of our skit crew, as you may know, as I was. And we would often act in the same skit and act across from each other. And the problem I had with Jack was that he would never study his lines. Everything was ad lib. And when you're somebody like me who pays very close attention to the script and works to memorize my lines and get the part right. It takes some doing to get used to somebody who is ad-libbing all the time because all of a sudden your carefully remembered and composed lines just go out the window and you've got to stay with them because the show goes on. (laughs) 
and that was a challenge because once he started to ad lib he became the center of attention and you were a sidelight so his son jack jr jack a beam was no longer in the church back then he wasn't you know an adversary of the church that he wanted to be a professional museum a musician rather excuse me and went out to do so so he actually created a band called stark naked and the car thieves and they played quite successfully in california and hawaii and other western um, venues he returned to the church in 1968 before he came back you know jack uh, his father loved to regale me with tales of his son and to me an aspiring musician at that point they were like tales of the gold rush so when jack jr if you will returned to the church i was a little intimidated but he became a fast friend even when he first came back he was clearly head and shoulders above everybody in terms of his musical talent so we would get together four or five of us who uh, you know had some interest in music and had some ability and as instrumentalists and you know we would just play as if we were just a garage band so jim quickly realized that jack jr had a hell of a lot of talent and appointed him to be the choir director and jack just took off and when i say that he really created the church choir of course we'd had a church choir before that but it was just your standard issue church choir you know you sing the old hymns and you sing the old hymns in the same old way but jack brought a level of musical talent and inventiveness that just hadn't been there before and so he really deserves all the credit you can give him for the album uh, he's the one who you know made contact with the people at the producer's workshop scheduled all the appointments you know put together the music and uh, made sure we were there to uh, to record as as he wanted us to record and he was a real de- he was a very demanding and perfectionistic choir director which is one of the reasons why the album to this day is is memorable in itself the beam family joined the temple in 1954 in indiana when jack arnold was just a kid his father jack senior and his mom ravina were loyal members but jack arnold a rebellious teenager did his own thing devoting himself to music. He wouldn't join the temple until more than a decade later in 1969. Yeah, my grandmother was the one who introduced us to him. The way my family met Jim was in Indianapolis when I was a kid. My grandmother and grandfather went to a church, Laurel Street Tabernacle. The minister there at that time, it was an older fellow named John Price, and my grandmother and grandfather went there. Somehow, you know, they were more religious background. They were talking to my mom and dad about this young guy that was a guest there that John Price had started inviting over to speak, you know, because he was a young guy getting started out and he was, I think, part Native American, I'm not sure. But they told him, you know, it was Jim Jones. And so, My mom and dad went there, you know, a few times and started listening to him. And he was more of a a practical kind of approach at that time, which was talking more about helping the needy people that were having a hard time, you know, getting by and all of that and those sorts of more social issues. And so that kind of resonated with my mom and dad. And over a period of time, they started following him. Well. As it turns out, uh, he started getting more followers coming to those meetings, and so he decided to start his own church. Uh, After he left Laurel Street Tabernacle, he started People's Temple, and it was at 15th and New Jersey in Indianapolis. Over a period of time, it just started expanding, but he built his whole ministry on, you know, feeding the hungry, helping people, and getting people straightened out that were messed up. So that's how that uh, we got in touch with uh, People's Temple. His message, even early days, was more about social issues rather than just Bible. He would throw a little Bible verse in there if it helped him make a point on a certain thing. It, It wasn't religion. He was on social issues. I had an uncle that was like a year older than I did, and he used to sing in the meetings and stuff, and I I thought, hey, man, if he can do that, so can I. So <laughs> I would, uh, every once in a while, get a chance to sing, you know, they, in, in the service somewhere, you know, they'd have a, a few songs, and then Jim would start talking, you know, that kind of thing. They were a lot more subdued in terms of before, like, when I'd 
did the album and in that time frame those were more uh, a lot more music oriented for the church service mainly uh in the early days there would be you know a few congregational songs and then jim would talk and then everybody would go home you know that's a, that's a lovely song i like that melody right now anyway sing it you need more cross Hold your hand up high. Four. Three. Wait, 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 wait. Three. I've been blessed beyond time for the buses because they will depart starting at 5 p.m. It's very important. Don't delay. You'll be standing here without a ride. I, I never was very religious because attending these traditional types of Christianity philosophy and the Bible and that sort of thing, having been exposed to all of that over a period of years as an individual, I never, it never resonated with me. There was too many contradictions in it to make sense to me. When uh, Jim started his own church over there on uh, New Jersey, I was more interested in the music aspect of what they were doing because at that particular time, I, as a young person growing up, I was into, you know, like a gospel feel and rhythm and blues and that sort of thing, you know. At that time, there was a uh, young gal, her name was Loretta Cordell, and she played at that time a Hammond organ as what they used as a traditional church music in there, you know. She did play, you know, more gospel-y feeling music and that sort of thing. So that's what kind of like caught my ear uh, because when I was, you know, younger, I was uh, taking piano lessons and all of that because my dad also played piano and that. He didn't play a lot, but he played, you know, at that time he was playing like boogie-woogie music and that. That was, was popular. But so that's what kind of got me interested in what they were associating with. It wasn't the uh, church thing per se. It was more picking up on the music and being interested in that part of it. Music has always been a driving force in Jack's life. His grandfather played piano with the Paul Whiteman band in the 20s, and his father, Jack Sr., carried on the family tradition playing boogie-woogie tunes for the family. Jack Arnold started learning piano at age nine, and thanks to the temple, fell in love with the sounds of the Hammond B3 organ and gospel choirs. He devoured all the R&B he could get his hands on, with favorites like Ray Charles, Sam Cooke, and Mahalia Jackson. Jack was determined to follow his dreams of becoming a professional musician. When Jim Jones moved to Brazil and Jack's parents decided to follow, Jack opted to stay behind and pursue his musical career. While they were gone, I basically was on my own at 17. I didn't want to go down there. It had no ear appeal to me. Whatever Jim was doing, I'm sure uh, he was involved in it. I don't know whether he particularly was with CIA, but he was assisting Jim in doing whatever needed to be done. They never talked about any of it. Well, the thing of it is, is to me, it sounded boring because I didn't believe in religion anyway. I was believed their cover story. It didn't seem appealing to me. And uh, I told them, you know, hey, I'll stay. And we had an apartment house at that time and was like trying to keep an eye on that aspect of it a little bit for them. So I didn't end up going with them. I had just graduated from high school and I was out of high school a few weeks before they uh, took off. So I had gotten a job and after they were gone about two weeks, I got fired <laughs> and uh, for trying to kill the manager. Uh, but anyway, we didn't get along too good. So, And being a kid, I didn't have real good control over my temper at that point. But anyway, 
I went ahead and got going again, got a job, and I had a really good friend that I had known through high school who was a guitar player and all of that, and uh, I got an old guitar, and it was in two pieces, and I got it all back together again, and then I got him to teach me how to play some chords and that, and that's how I got going. They went to California, because I guess they had already figured out it was during that time that, uh, you know, there was a pretty heavy interest in what Russia was doing and this and that, that there might be a war. And at that time, Jones was more interested in in moving to uh, California. There was a place called Redwood Valley that he had heard of that could survive maybe a nuclear war because of how the mountains and all of that were laid out there that possibly could survive that. So anyway, they went there. Well, my buddy, like I said, that I had been working with in terms of learning how to play and getting all that going, uh, his name was Jerry Mills. And uh, he and I wanted to be in, in the real music business. And you either went to New York or you went to LA. And since my parents had moved to California, we thought, hey, why don't we go out there and see you know, if we can get something going. Over the next several years, Jack toured the country, honing his musical skills playing nightclubs in California, Hawaii, and Vegas. Jack loved R&B, funk, and soul. Growing up in the temple had trained his ears to the sounds of gospel and spiritual hymns. The time Jack spent performing with rock bands in the 60s expanded his creative abilities and taught him the ways of the stage. I was with a group called Starting in the Car Thieves, and we were playing Vegas at the uh, Pussycat Agogo at that time, which is no longer in existence. At that time, it was one of the only dance clubs. I had moved to California in 63 from Indiana. My best friend, Jerry Mills came out with me and we stayed initially at my folks' house, but then we got our own apartment. When I came out there, I got a job working at GM uh, at an assembly plant out there. And he went to work playing with some guys at a band in town because we moved to Hayward, California. I left GM and we started playing uh, a nightclub in the Hayward area. From there, Another friend of mine from Indiana had come out to California. Three guys he knew who were singers that had bands in Indiana, you know, had sung with guys in Indiana. They came out here and they got going. And uh, to make a long story short, there were six of us. We went on the road, uh, we're playing places in Southern California and in like Vegas and that kind of stuff. While I was in Vegas with them, one of the guys got drafted and uh, he got out of the draft, but we had hired a guy from the casinos, which was a hit group uh, out of Cincinnati. It was Glenn Hughes. And he uh, was singing in the band when this guy who had gotten drafted, you know, out of our group came back. Well, we got in a big blowout because a couple of the guys wanted him back in the group and, you know, da da da. So I quit the band there, gave my notice, and then I ran into a guy uh, named Chuck Gerard, who had had the hit records and stuff, who was working with a group called the Castells, and then he had left them and started a group called Chuck and Joe. And Joe was also in the uh, casinos and stuff. And so we locally picked up a guitar player, a drummer that they knew who was in L.A. who uh, we got together with. And there was six of us because it started out as a Vegas group. They were calling it Six the Hard Way, which is like there were three singers in front and three guys playing in back, which is two threes of Six the Hard Way in dice talk. These guys had houses and apartments in L.A., and we went back to put a whole thing together for that group. Okay, when I met them in Vegas, we didn't start playing in Vegas with them. We went back to L.A. to regroup, and we played places, outlying areas in L.A., you know, kind of smaller clubs and whatnot, in order to get tightened up as a group. 
then once we got tight, I was able to get a hold of a uh, manager that I had met in Vegas, you know, who wanted to work with us because most of the guys that were in that Six the Hard Way were all from head groups, pretty much. Then he started booking us, you know, everywhere. We played all over the West Coast and we were recording. That's what I loved about originally when I started out to get into music before anything is I wanted to be in the recording business and stuff, not, you know, playing bars and casinos and all of that, you know, playing the drunks. But <laughs> I wanted to write and arrange and, you know, create. Well, Sunrise was at the time when the Mamas and Papas were a style of music that was happening then. And the guy singing lead, that uh, kid called Chuck Gerard. Now, he he left uh, Six the Hard Way. Uh, we were in Hawaii, and him and Ernie, the, one, the drummer, while we were over there, uh, everybody dropped acid, and he got religion. <laughs> For Jack, the 60s had been an exciting and productive time, while audiences flocked to his shows searching for a good time and consciousness expansion. Jack was discovering his higher purpose. Up till now, being a rock star had been Jack's dream, and for nearly a decade he lived the dream playing in clubs like The Factory in LA during a legendary time for rock bands. Music was a language Jack spoke fluently, but the stage no longer inspired him. As the 60s wound down and Jack tired of touring, he turned his attention to new pursuits, becoming a music producer. Around 69 is when I went back with the temple and the reason why I did it, I got tired of playing nightclubs, playing the drunks. I wanted to be in production. You know, I wanted to be making the music. And uh, so I wanted to get off the road and what had happened while well, I was still on the road. My mom, I had mentioned on a phone call to her because they were living in Ukiah then, which is, you know, right by Redwood Valley. Anyway, I had mentioned to her that, I, you know, I'd like to go back to college and uh, study music and uh, all of that, uh, writing and arranging all the different aspects of, you know, music. So uh, she had mentioned, hey, you know, we got a program going on here at Beatles Temple because she knows I knew, every, you know, him, Jones and everybody and that. She said, you know, if you come here, you know, they'll pay for your education and, uh, you know, you'll get a chance to do that. So that's how I got into the whole idea of going there uh, in 69. Jack Arnold Beam officially joined the Temple in 1969 with the understanding that the Temple would pay for his college education. The Temple immediately made use of Jack's talents and put him to work with the Temple Choir. After I got there and was there for a while, they asked me to work with the choir, so I got to give a lot of credit to uh, Loretta Cordell, who was the organist. She and I had to try to find out first of all we started out singing some of the songs that the congregation had sang but doing arrangements of them and and whatnot you know and at that time he was still doing trips like or he had started doing trips to san francisco and to la and whatnot during that time frame it was just starting so we would drive buses down there and uh, you know have meetings doing that as they started out, it wasn't as much music as it was like traveling to these places and him doing mainly talking. Loretta would do a couple of congregational songs because it was a mixed audience of people of color and white people and whatnot. It was kind of a variety of a mixture. More people started coming up to Redwood Valley because I was like going to college. Uh, I started college at Santa Rosa Junior College. Then I ended up graduating from San Francisco State studying music and I had a degree in social work. What happened was we were gathering younger people who were really into music and whatnot. And then, you know, we were able to take some like traditional songs that might have been sung in, you know, in black churches and not that they sang that were traditional kinds of things. And we started mixing those. And then I started writing stuff, but that's how we did it was with the new people coming in and picking up 
from their backgrounds, you know, songs, traditional songs and whatnot that they were doing, making arrangements out of them. And also, we had to leave the situation open that if you want to sing in the choir, you know, you can do it. Now, uh, there was another young lady named uh, Anita Imes. Uh, she was uh, helping also. She and I and Loretta would get together and we would work out the song harmonies and this and that together with that. And then Anita, while I was working with the band while we were playing, putting that together, helped teach the new people the parts to the songs. That, you know, if it was soprano or alto or give them parts and then we'd rehearse with that until they were able to get it down. Well, after a couple of years, we were really getting pretty good. And uh, at that point, I thought, you know, it'd be neat if we had a record, you know, or something like that, because at that time, everybody that was in kind of a leadership position of some sort, uh, we're thinking about how to make money for the temple, you know, so that we could travel a little bit with them and, you know, to have some income on it, you know, to help pay expenses and whatnot for the church. The idea of making an album came up and I told I told Jim that, you know, that would be a, in my opinion, since I already, you know, was in that, to be a good way to help not only spread, you know, your message idea, but uh, also making some income, you know, to help support. So that's how that all got lined up. For Mike Wood, Jack Arnold's arrival was like the return of the mysterious prodigal son. In the years Jack was playing professionally, Jack Sr. would often speak admiringly of his son and relate stories of the young rocker's adventures. When Mike finally met Jack Arnold, he described him as every inch a blonde Paul McCartney, complete with a Fu Manchu mustache, hip floral shirt, and red on black bell bottoms. I was totally impressed with Jack when he returned because he was my image of the badass rock star. He came in with his, you know, Fu Manchu mustache and long blonde hair and red and black bell bottoms and uh, seven leaguer boots, and he was just the image. Jack himself recounted in an article he wrote entitled Sing the Song of Life, Follow Your Dreams, that when he went to his first temple meeting, he felt like a duck out of water. With his long hair and big bell bottoms, he was the only hippie in the place. When he walked in and sat down, he could feel everyone's eyes on him, as if they were thinking, how the hell did he get in here? At this point, Jack wasn't sure if he would stay in Ukiah or not, even if the college was free. Jack was used to doing his own thing, which at that time included smoking weed and having fun. Temple life would be structured with limitations, but for Jack, the opportunity to change the world through music and produce works of his own was worth the sacrifices. Jack committed himself to the movement and its humanitarian causes. The temple was getting people off drugs and helping the downtrodden of the world. Later, when we see Jack on the album cover of He's Able or performing with the temple band during faith healings, he's clean shaven with short hair, wearing a light blue dress shirt as was the style of the choir. Though his appearance became more conservative after joining the temple, his musical progressions remain as funky and far out as his rocker persona had been. I really believed in trying to help people that needed a break, you know, and most of them were black. Not all, but most made sense to me at that time in my life to try to help. And the only way I could have helped at that time was music. As choir director, Jack found himself surrounded by incredible talent, with a head full of fresh ideas and songs. Jack knew with a lot of work and a little polish, he could produce something unique that sounded professional and reach more people with his music than ever before. It's more remarkable even than you might think, because he had to take what he was given in the church. Fortunately, there were a lot of talented people. They weren't under any kind of administration. Uh, they were just, you know, exercising their talent on their own. So someone might get up and sing a song, and it'd be a beautiful song. But it wasn't, it wasn't organized, it wasn't arranged, it wasn't, it wasn't charted, nothing like that. They just sing. You know, hey, they're inspired to sing, and they'd sing. So Jack would basically had a good idea who had what talent. He would put them together. You know, he wrote most of the songs on the album, and even those he didn't write, he arranged them. He had a great way of doing it. We were a headband. We didn't have anything written down at all. 
Jack would basically figure out whatever part he was interested in, in, in developing and play it on the guitar. And then he would hum it to whomever was going to be playing or, or singing that part. So they really learned it. In, in their heads. Fortunately, we had a hell of a lot of a great many talented people. Deanna Wilkinson, of course, comes to mind, or Shirley Smith, you know, even Jack himself, or his sister, Joyce. People who had come from musical traditions in their uh, in their own communities or in their own spiritual practices, and he was able to meld them together and put together a heck of a music experience, and uh, he gets all the credit in the world for, for he's able. Jack has an organic approach to writing music that has evolved over the years as technology has changed. It cannot be overstated the complexity of producing an album before the modern age of digital recording. Jack spent hours working songs out in his head before humming and playing the individual parts of songs to his musicians and vocalists. I've written songs every way there is. Sometimes I'll get, you know, a track that I like, a feel that I like, and I'll work with that, and then I'll put lyric to it. Or I'll start out with just lyrics and then, uh, you know, put tracks to it. When I started out recording, it was two-track recording. You put 30 people in a studio, and you do it down until everybody gets it right one time. And if you're right at the end of a song and you screw it up, you got to start over again because two track was before you could overdub and all that. How did the idea of doing the album come about? Well, I had I had two memories about that. It was kind of like back and forth. And I, I know that he had mentioned something about it, but I think I upon recollection of it, because it's been a while, uh, I think I may have put it out there first, but then uh, he got interested in it right away uh, when I mentioned the word money. Located next to a porno theater on Hollywood Boulevard, the producer's workshop, though a bit small and minimalistic, housed some of the best modern recording equipment of the era. Classic albums like Pink Floyd's The Wall and Fleetwood Mac's Rumors were recorded and engineered there. I had a uh, producer's workshop do it. We got it together. It was all done on 16-track recording at that time, which was the best you could get. 24-track hadn't come out yet. Then we had to get a company to, to press it for us. Jim says, well, how much will it cost? And I think the total cost is about six grand. So well, Jim said, well, how are we going to make that money back? He said, well, we'll sell the albums at the church, you know, after the meetings for, you know, 10 bucks an album. Said, okay, it's a great idea. You know, everybody went out to Golden Gate Park one day to have their picture taken for the album. I wasn't there for that. You know, we had all these albums and, you know, we would sell them at the church meetings. In all of our temples, we would have, um, and I think Deanna Myrtle is the one who really started this. You would have trinkets, you know, Jim's picture and keychains with Jim on them uh, and Jim in various poses to protect you from different ailments or accidents or whatnot. And so this became one of the um, one of the items for sale uh, at the tables that were right there in the church vestibule as people walked out. So it was just another item of merchandise and a way to make more money for the church. On the album's cover, we see the choir posing in Golden Gate Park. They're standing in front of the portals of the past. The white columns of the monument once marked the entrance to the Knob Hill Mansion, a garish palace built by a wealthy railroad tycoon. Those pillars are all that remain of San Francisco's Gilded Era mansions after the 1906 earthquake. I didn't come up with that. I think the Myrtles. I think that Deanna might have thought about doing that. I think they mentioned it to us, you know, that that might be a good idea to shoot it that way since we were in San Francisco a lot, you know, at the other building. So uh, we lined up. They took it that way that day. How were the songs chosen for the album? I took what I thought at that time were the ones that had our best arrangements at that time. Uh, there was other songs that we could have done, but I thought at that time, based on what I had to work with, that those particular ones would probably be enough of a cross-section for listeners who, uh, you know, like one thing or another, some like gospel, some like pop, this and that, and I tried to, like, get that feeling and, uh, you know, along with what was being said uh, in the songs, you know, to try to be a balance. 
No, there was a lot of stuff we could have done. I had more songs written and stuff, but at that time I'd already gotten out of college and we were traveling a lot around the country doing all these performances and stuff with Jim. And uh, it just never got to the point. We were selling that one, so many of them, that it never got to a point we thought about, you know, cutting another one. And by the time I initially thought maybe it would be good to cut another one, it got to a point where I was going to leave, and so that kind of just faded out. Jack was given a lot of creative control over the album, but recording sessions had to be organized around the Temple's busy schedule. Oh, yeah, it was real busy because believe it or not the album was kind of like when we get a chance to do something we'll go do it you know what i mean because we were so busy traveling back and forth but what i had to do was kind of lay out a whole idea to myself and kind of make lists of how i'm going to organize first of all you have to get the band in and uh, lay the tracks and put those arrangements together and record them And then once we got to that point, because what I'd have to do is I'd have to figure when we go to L.A., we couldn't get out of there till about, you know, maybe 11, 12 o'clock at night, maybe sometimes later than that, to get into the studio. So I had to, like, book time ahead of time. And then after the meeting in L.A., get the guys together. We'd get in a bus, and I'd drive the bus over to a producer workshop there on Hollywood Boulevard. And we'd lay tracks, and so we did all the tracks over a period of a few weeks to get all of the band tracks together. Then, you know, lay out what we were going to do for, uh, in terms of the vocals of the choir background singing, and take them in and do background tracks of the vocals. And then I had to organize everyone who was singing lead on each one of those songs. We had organized them, take them in, and record the vocals last. It was just a matter of, you know, getting it organized after those meetings and all that. That's what I had. That was the real hard part. For several weekends, from midnight to early in the morning, Temple members crowded into the producer's workshop, fascinated by the professional recording equipment and excited to be a part of the album. They patiently awaited their turn in the booth, taking naps between takes. You would lay down tracks individually. You know, the guys who were in the mastering lab, would you would lay down the bass track first and the guitar track or the rhythm track. And then uh, it would from there. And Jack was instrumental in every single second of all that. So, I mean, he knew all those songs so well that I remember with the technician, we were trying to redo something and we didn't want to have to go back and redo it in song, but they wanted to take care of it technologically. So they had to find this one note and just and make whatever the adjustment was. I've forgotten now. <laughs> and Jack could pick out the song with just one single note. So the, uh, and the technician said, damn, man, how'd you do that? And Jack said, well, I wrote most of these songs. <laughs> it was really kind of fun. I mean, most of the time I wasn't playing because, you know, my, I would be laying down a track at one point and then, you know, that really was all I needed to do. But I, you know, it was a great way to get out of the planning commission's meeting. So I would always go. And it's always fun to kind of walk around Hollywood when I wasn't needed. And, and the way it works is, you know, you get into it with me. I was alone. You know, you got your earphones on, these padded earphones, and you're in a recording booth and, uh, you know, bang, you play. That's how the solos were recorded. And then Rick and I would, Rick and I, I think it was the rhythm section, would record our bits together. And then Jack would add in choir or the other way around, something like that. But you could really manage the recording because you had all these different tracks. You know, it wasn't a whole bunch of people singing at any one time. And Jack could use very few people and only the best people. So it came out sounding pretty damn good. Jack, he was a hard ass. I mean, I've got to tell you, he was a real hard ass as a director. He knew exactly what he wanted and the way a sound and would not tolerate any deviation. And he knew <laughs> if you if you weren't playing your part exactly as you'd been told to play it, you know, he would give you a glance to let you know you hadn't slipped anything by him and that you're going to have to answer for it. So he was uh, he was demanding and perfectionistic as he had to be. And that's why the album is as good as it is. That's why it has a kind of a, it has a kind of integrity to it. You, it, you know, all the songs, of course, are different and they have different soloists, but it has a sound 
and um, and a style, and that is down to Jack. Period. We sometimes journey We often know not Know not Which way to turn Jack was the architect behind the aesthetic and sound of the album with his uncompromising ear and commitment to his vision Track by track, the album came together. You know something? I was happy at the time that fidelity-wise, it came out good. When I heard the whole thing completely finished, there were some things that I wish I had mixed better. In all of them, I wish that it had just a little bit more bass bottom. Not a lot, but just a little bit more bass bottom on them for a little more punch on some of them. Before I decided that we'll put our own album out and uh, uh, work with it that way, but I went to several labels, you know, to try to get them to go for a deal so that I could get them to put it out front rather than us putting up the money to do, you know, the hours and the, everything, you know. And uh, they... Pretty much all of them turned me down flat. So that's how we ended up, us putting it out ourselves. Everybody that was pretty much on it and played on it and was, you know, I'm talking about the band, the singers, this and that. None of them had ever been in a, in a recording studio. None of them had ever done anything any remotely like this. But the thing of it is none of them never was in a recording studio. So it was really easy to work with everybody because they were all paying attention, you know, to what's going on because they were jazzed about it. I was wanting the people that did it to be happy with their work. That's really what I was more interested in. Jack wrote several original songs for the album, including Because of Him, Set Them Free, Will You, and Hold On Brother. His contemporary compositions complemented more traditional pieces adapted for the album. Every walk of life that filled the pews and temple services was represented on the album. Don Beck, the director of the Junior Choir, worked diligently to get the children ready for their recording sessions at the studio. The Junior Choir, originally created to keep the temple's children occupied and engaged during services, had become a feather in the temple's musical cap. Thank you, dear ones. It is written of old, if there's anything lovely or anything of good report, to think on that. And I can't think of anything more lovely than you, so I can think on that. As I look at these beautiful young people, I wonder where on Friday night could you find a group of young people so vivacious and so outgoing and so beautiful as our young people are. And up there, the balcony of little fellows that uh, we need a very mixed service, they need to be down where they can sing to us here, because they always sing so faithfully up there in the balcony. A whole balcony of little fellows, and we're so grateful for them, too. A wonderful, wonderful young. Don Beck, he is uh, the one, really, that organized the children. I think he was teaching a Sunday school class for the kids. Now, I could be wrong on this. What I was thinking was that as he did it for a little while, then somehow the junior, he wanted to have them sing. And uh, he came up with that song, Welcome. I don't know where that came from. Well, again, what we had done was we had already recorded all the tracks and everything. And so uh, I'm thinking he brought in maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 kids. And uh, we put headphones on them. Then they would run the track down and he would stand in front of them and, you know, kind of like choir directing. We give them all headphones and put it it on them and they all uh, welcome. Nothing happened in that studio probably. It it would go between 11 and three o'clock or 12 and three o'clock in the morning. In fact, as I recall, some of them were kind of like nodding out uh, in between doing stuff and whatnot. The children, 
between the ages of 5 and 12, slept anywhere they could between takes at the producer's workshop. Spread out on the floor and under tables, they rested until it was their turn. Then wiping the sleep from their eyes, they donned headphones and delivering the same enthusiasm they would Sunday mornings, belted out a giant welcome. Musically, Welcome is the most lighthearted, carefree song on the album. Personally, it has always reminded me of the theme to Sesame Street. But for many former members who knew the little personalities behind the voices, the song is a brutal reminder of just how much potential was wasted on November 18th, 1978. Walking with your father was Shirley Smith and Deanna Wilkinson. Hold on, brother, was the whole choir. And uh, Deanna Wilkinson sang, he's able, is Shirley Smith. I played guitar and bass on different ones on there. Now, the guy that played regular bass was Bob Houston. The drummers, they were kids. One of the drummers was Danny Pietla, and one of them was Lou Jones played on a couple things. And Danny Curtin played on some. And uh, Loretta played organ, Hammond B3, and uh, Deanna played piano. I went to a meeting last night, but my heart wasn't right. Something's Got a Hold of Me, sung by Ruth Coleman, is probably the most well-known song on the album. The lyrics tell the story of the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. The music plays to the adulation of the crowd, a high-energy tune that represents the temple's earthly connection to God and Joan's miracle of laying hands. Now, horn players, Mike played tenor saxophone. Rick Cordell played trombone. Rick was the trombonist in, uh, in our band and one heck of a good trombonist. He was a great talent, and I was always uh, inspired by his playing and worked hard to keep up with him. And we had a pretty good brass section. Walk a Mile in My Shoes, a cover sung by Melvin Johnson, soulfully implores the audience to avoid casting stones and have compassion for one another. By hurting each other, we can only harm ourselves. An important message of unity that would become one of Elvis Presley's Vegas go-tos. Brian Kevin wrote extensively about He's Able for his master's thesis. His article, Songs Largely in the Key of Life, eloquently capture the essence of the album. In his article, he wrote that Melvin Johnson was 25 when he joined the temple. He had spent most of his life in and out of prison for sex trafficking and drug charges. After Melvin joined the temple in San Francisco, he turned his life around and became a temple bus driver and joined the choir. Melvin's vocals have an authenticity, like someone who believes every word he's singing. Melvin never went to Jonestown, but legend has it after leaving the temple, he returned to street crime and passed away in the 90s. Well, Melvin was you know, a member of the choir, and he came to us out of the African Methodist Episcopal churches. You know, he was very comfortable with the musical tradition and had a beautiful voice on his own. It was a little bit gritty, but uh, that made it even more attractive. And he was one of our soloists. In fact, was a soloist uh, on Walk a Mile in My Shoes. Melvin and I were, we were never bosom buddies because I was a college student and my bosom buddies were all my fellow college students, but we were we were good friends. I enjoyed talking with uh, Mel and riding a bus with him occasionally. And of course, when I once I left the church in early 1977, all my contacts with temple members were essentially cut off. So 
I hadn't seen uh, Mel for a long time. I mean, I, after that, I didn't see Mel at all until after the massacre. I was walking home from work. I worked in Bank of America building in um, Montgomery Street in San Francisco, and I lived in a, a little um, apartment in the Tenderloin in San Francisco just off of Geary Street. So I would walk from home to the to my job and from job to home on Geary Street, just, you know, just like anybody working, just think my thoughts and just uh, walk until I got to where I was going. So I'm walking home one afternoon up Geary Street and this cab just jerks to us, screeches to a halt. And this big guy gets out and starts running toward me. And I thought, oh, what? did I not pay a cab fare? I mean, is this guy, am I going to get my butt beat here? What's happening? And uh, so I was getting ready to run away and I looked as, as he got closer, I looked at that, oh my God, it's Melvin Johnson. And so I ran out into the middle of the street to meet him and we just grabbed each other and hugged each other and cried. And he said, Mike, I thought you were dead. I said, Mel, I thought you were dead. And we just continued to h hug each other and cry. <laughs> And, and and bring ourselves up to date with where we were. It was just an amazing experience. Of course, as you can imagine, all the cars, here is a very busy street, particularly at commute hours. And so here we are uh, in this uh, situation. And you know, the cars, the you know, horns, were, horns were blaring and the drivers were uh, flipping us off and telling us to get the hell out of the road. So, uh, and so Mel had to go park his car and, and come back and we had a nice chat after that. Uh, it was a great story. I don't think I saw Mel again after that. I understand that he had a troubled life and I'm sorry to hear that. And that he uh, uh, he's no longer with us and I'm sorry to hear that. He was, I, I really thought he was a, a great, great character. Uh, you know, it warms my heart whenever I think about it. Because we were both, we were shocked that each other was, that we each were alive. You know, uh, <laughs> it, it's it's just, it, it's hard. I guess it's hard for someone who doesn't go through that experience to understand. But to see somebody like that, it's as if they've come back to life. Set them free was like talking about working with people that are having trouble with their lives in terms of making it either to get where they're trying to go and also being discriminated against and all the things that, that work in terms of our societal values against people. It was kind of like, you know, if we show them love, that could be like the first step in helping them to see that there might be a glimmer of hope for them. And in that regard, set them free, you know, in terms of emotion. We had uh, Mike playing tenor, and we had uh, Rick Cordell playing uh, trombone. Uh, I play uh, on that song, I'm playing bass. Everybody was really uh, played well. Mike Wood counts his saxophone solo for Set Them Free as the high point of his musical career. When he left the temple, he was forced to leave everything behind, his family, his friends, and his beloved sax. By the way, my saxophone was, you know, like the Stradivarius of saxophones. I mean, you know, you name all the famous sax players you've ever heard of, and they were playing that horn. So it was Selmer Mark VI. God, I, I, my mother paid $650 for that horn. This was back at a time when my dad didn't make much more than that monthly. And the reason she did it, she bought it for me, is because she and I had a, she wanted me to be a musician. I want to be a musician. And, you know, I had this funky old horn from her dad, and she knew that I wanted to sell her because it's the best horn in the world. Um, and so she made an agreement with me. If I went through so many instruction books, that she would buy me the horn. And I did. I carried out my end of the bargain and took me down to Lazarus, and by God, we bought the damn horn. It, it was so beautiful. You know, the Selmers were, I mean, the, the lacquer ring was perfect. And, you know, it had these concave mother of pearl buttons that, you know, to press. Um, it was just, and it was just magnificent. Um, and it came in this fabulous case. It was very modern, very styled. I used to sleep with the, the horn in the case right next to my bed so I could have my hand on it. So, anyway, I love my horn. So, anyway, when I was leaving, you know, I tried to find the goddamn thing. But I think somehow... 
somebody had just inadvertently because I kept it down with the with the with the instruments, right? Because at that point I didn't have a place of my own, blah blah blah, and I wasn't too interested in music. I was interested in getting out, and I went down to look for it, but I couldn't find it. So I assumed it was on a bus on the way to Los Angeles, and came back, and I was gone, and it was there. Stephen played it from time to time, but he never did anything with it. Uh, there's a guy. There's another guy though, a tenor player by the name of his name was Brian Bouquet, I think. And Brian was a very talented musician, and he actually went to Guyana and died down there. And I've seen a couple of pictures of him in the band down there playing tenor sax, and he was—that was my horn. So I'm sure my horn went to Guyana, and I have no idea what happened to it after that. I assume that my horn was down there and got, you know, stolen by whoever came in and maybe sold on the black market or something. I don't. I hope it's being played today, but uh, I don't know. Because I love that one, but it's the only thing I really wish I'd been able to take. Not because of the monetary value, just because of the sentimental value. And of course, you know, I wish I, you know, I, I condemn myself for not trying to talk Patricia or even Harriet into leaving with me because Suzanne and I have long since broken up. But um, you know, I, 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 I didn't. I, I, we, who, who knew everybody's going to die? I mean, I know that there were, that we had those suicide drills, but I thought those were just loyalty tests, and everybody else did too. Uh, I, I, I thought I could come back and particularly get my sister out, you know. But anyway, didn't happen. You know, the people were really good-natured people. We were caught up in our own cultishness because that that was part of what was required of us. But I, I always have said, and I truly believe, that we were betrayed by our good intentions. When you meet the people at the People's Temple afterwards, you know, most of them are really pretty damn good people. So people who are just, you know, trying to get through life and who want to do all the good things that people want to do, and and really felt good about the commitment they made to the positive goals that we were trying to uh, achieve. We had scheduled it for him to come in and do his vocal. We already had the tracks. Loretta already recorded the organ with it and all that. He came in and he had his entourage, you know, his uh, bodyguards, quote, so to speak, uh, were all dressed in black with their little red berets and uh, everybody in in the booth looked over at that and thought, what the heck is this, dude? They come marching in anyway, and so they all uh, had a place to sit down and uh, had them queue up the track, and uh, he just did an overdub on it, you know, because we already had the music there. But it was weird. Those guys thought, what the hell is going on here? I could tell by their looks on their face, you know, that this is weird. Jim Jones insisted, against Jack's vision for the album, on performing his reworking of O Solo Mio. The 20-year-old sound engineer Bob Shaper, assigned to work the booth after hours, recalls Jones' dramatic entrance to the producer's workshop. Jim Jones was likely more threatened by the talent of the choir members than he was the studio, but as always, wherever he went, he was sure to leave an impression. As over-the-top as the armed entourage may have been, the tension in the air likely added to the recording, as it is without a doubt the most cumbersome, least groovy tune on the album. Jim has a nice voice, but his delivery sounds somewhat self-conscious and overly contrived. Mike Wood once said in an interview that there was a hidden subtext to why Jim Jones recorded this particular song, as if Jim is really saying, I'm God and I came down for my glory. This song, more than any of the others, is a throwback to the early days of the temple before Jack Arnold, when the temple was more traditional and a whole lot wider. It's a bit of a square peg in an otherwise circular flow, and Jones, compared to the energy of the rest of the performers, is just kind of square. It's also kind of a traditional 
that sang in other churches down from his glory in terms of a religious kind of congregational song that other churches have sang too. He was trying to still promote the idea. It was in part of the functioning, pushing ideas about him being God. And that was part of getting that started, you know, for the people that believed what they thought they saw in terms of his healings and his metaphysical uh, attributes and whatnot. So that's kind of what that was all about for him. And I didn't want to put it on the album, but at that time, there was no getting around it, that you had to have the focus on who the focus was supposed to be about. His love has no limit. That's the thing to remember, his love has no limit. Father, socialism, yes, sweet, thank you for what you've done. If you had breast cancer, you'd be, you'd be singing a little louder. Father, we thank you. Possibly my favorite and certainly the most hauntingly beautiful track on the album is Black Baby, performed by Marceline Jones, accompanied by Loretta Cordell, and Richard Tropp. Not unlike Down From His Glory, the song has a different feel from the rest of the album. The recording is a bit raw, the musical influence is more European, but the themes speak the message of the album, and Marceline's delivery of the vocals is anything but contrived. Loretta's organ swells against the soft chimes of ethereal bells, as Richard's cello hums a somber melody. Marceline's voice begins with a whispering vibrato, the melody becoming increasingly haunting as the song builds to a crescendo. Now that was Nina Simone's record of Brown Baby that uh, Marceline had changed the words to after they had adopted Jimmy Jr. Loretta played organ I heard that song when I first came back. She was singing it in one of the meetings, and she would sing it every once in a while, but they changed the lyrics of it so it made more sense from her personal viewpoint. And she came in, and I think she did it in one or two takes because she had sang that song so many times. Dick Tropp, he played uh, cello. The uh, cello and the organ together, it made a real dramatic sound. The organ melts into the abyss as Marceline's falsetto, raw and emotional, transforms the soft lullaby into a mournful dirge. Marceline's performance of Black Baby speaks to a promise she made to her adopted black child, as well as a promise she and her husband made to all the children of the temple. Mommy and Daddy will protect you and keep you safe from harm. Judging by the emotion in Marceline's voice, it was a promise she felt passionately about. The tragic beauty of Richard's cello ominously transforms the piece with soulful phrases like tears caught in your throat. My little black baby. And with all that song for so long for years, the meaning of those words are beautiful. One thing to hear Marcy's sweet voice, another to hear the words. I don't know, several years back, I opened my album and uh, just made copies of it. I had the first album that's out, but it's open now. In uh, in 1993, we had what was called the No Name Storm, and I live right on a big river. It's a big one. What happened was, in the middle of the night, about four or five o'clock in the morning, to it had been storming all night long, thundering and storming and carrying on. Well, I woke up about five o'clock in the morning, and I heard water 
Well, outside my bedroom window is my swimming pool, and I thought, well, maybe because it's been raining and thundering and carrying on all this time, that the swimming pool is overrunning, and uh, I didn't know it, you know. So I got up to look out the window to see what's happening with the swimming pool, and when I put my feet on the ground, it was in about five inches of water. So I, <laughs> I looked out my other window there by the uh, in the bedroom, at the river and the river was in my uh house so in a period of about 30 40 minutes or so it was waist deep in my house and went past my house a block or so i had all my stuff out in the garage uh in a box stuff uh of all those uh, originals and uh the the flood wiped them out so i had fish in my garage so uh, that was an exciting part, but yeah, I lost a lot of stuff, cassettes and stuff that over the years of songs, you know, that I'd wrote and had, you know, copies of, of some, of, you know, of the stuff we'd done, and that all got wiped out too. In the same year as the no-name storm that destroyed the master recordings of He's Able, a mysterious underground record label called Grey Matter released He's Able on CD. Only their version included a 13th track, the audio from The Last Day in Jonestown, otherwise known as The Death Tape. Researchers have tried to uncover who was behind the re-release. Jack Arnold was never asked permission or contacted about it, though he is aware of its existence. Researchers' efforts uncovered some interesting connections to Genesis Peorage and Monty Cazaza, pioneers of the industrial music scene. But in the end, it was never uncovered who released the CD. Legend has it that Kazaza broke into the San Francisco temple shortly after the tragedy and absconded with memorabilia. Even after all this time, tales oh of forgotten temple recordings and newfound footage circulate amongst researchers. There's no telling what might still be out there undiscovered. Jack Arnold Beam exceeded everyone's expectations as a music director and record producer. The end product was masterfully executed and entertaining to listen to. Jack helped the temple develop its sound, and that would accompany Jim Jones' speeches as they traveled through the nation. The music was often someone's first and last impression of the temple and its mission. Prominent figures, politicians, and other churches invited the temple to perform both in the United States and later in Guyana. Temple members, though extraordinarily talented, presented the image of everyday people united for a common cause, an image anyone seeking votes or followers gladly stood behind. Jack was happy with his experience making the album and working with the Temple Choir, but over time, there were aspects of Temple life that made him reconsider his membership. You know something, the, the music drug in so much and the other part of it was the speculation on older people's part you know when we would go we would get invited to go sing and stuff you know and him speak he would have people acting like they were you know newcomers to the church usually they would be dressed up as older people and he would do fake healings and stuff and the people who were in the audience who had no idea who we were or who he was you know saw that and between the music and the exuberance of all of that you know vibe and him doing stuff like that it was a a shoe in you know that they'd follow him but without the music it wouldn't be near as dynamic as it got. When I heard that they were talking about going to the jungle, you know, and uh, I, I just, I, I wasn't going to do that. I mean, I had too many things I wanted to really do in terms of my own pursuit of music and whatnot to be strung out. And I had also known enough to know what was going on uh, with his whole outfit. And I thought to myself, because you couldn't really talk to anybody or go straight to him. But I thought to myself, he gets your ass out there in the jungle, you ain't going nowhere. The more I found out and the more I learned, being there and being around the group that he had his meetings with and stuff privately, you know, the planning commission and all that, because they drafted me into that. And after I saw 
everything. I just, uh, I went home and I told him, Cindy, pack it up, babe, we're out of here. In 1976, Jack Arnold Beam and his wife Cindy left the temple. The years Jack spent living his dreams of writing music for a great humanitarian cause had turned into a living nightmare. Because of Jack's proximity to Jim Jones, he knew life in Jonestown would be nothing less than a prison, and his music would be used to recruit more workers into a cause that was becoming a dictatorship. All of the good intentions and dreams Jack conceptualized for He's Able turned to ashes in the wake of Jones' narcissism. The paranoia fueling the fires of Jones' constant rage threatened to burn down all they had built. Jones began to alienate temple leaders like Jack with his erratic behavior and shifting ideals. What the hell, you always question my honesty. Question my honesty. I, anybody know that I gave all these millions up when I could have collected it. You people would have given it to me. When I healed you, how many have I healed? How many have I got out of trouble? How many have I got your loved ones out of jail? So obviously I'm not, uh, I'm not taking advantage. Who in the hell wants this as a picnic? First comers, they said, well, he, there's some rumor that I'm, I'm going to come over here and make slaves out of the people and, and kick you off after I've got the place. What the hell would I want with it? I don't want to even live. So what would I want with this place? Listening to him uh, it, right at the end, I started really hawking in on him, but he was always, you know, I smoked grass and all that stuff when I was out on my own in music full time and all that stuff before I even came there. And I knew the guy was ripped because I could look at the look at his eyes. Before I left, I started really paying attention to the guy and I knew he was, you know, Jack. But when he was down there in Jonestown, he was so strung out on drugs and being insecure to start with and paranoid to the max. Uh, and I mean, he was paranoid up here before he ever went down there because I worked with enough musicians strung out on pills and dope and all kinds of stuff. I thought it would be basically the same crap that was going on uh, while I was in there. And that is uh, that they want to, you know, have a commune and this and that. And I was thinking to myself, they'll be out in the hot sun down by the equator. It's gonna be a lot of fun out there picking up crap and working all day in the hot sun while Jones is in his apartment getting stoned. When you get like that where you're every day, you're just, you know, wiped out. Paranoia emotionally that it, it tends to put one through uh, that I knew I'm not gonna be going along with all this. I'm just not, I'm not putting up with that. The music of People's Temple would go on evolving with the message in Jack's absence. Life in the jungle influenced the music. Guyana was now their home. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're glad to have you here in Jonestown, Guyana. Sit back and enjoy yourself. We have a brief program. Presenting to you the Jones County Split. You know, when down there in Jonestown, it was during his sermons and stuff, he would stop and let somebody sing, you know, maybe solo, and would have the choir or the band participate in it while he's. Uh, shooting up his cocaine. When they got everybody down there to Jonestown, they called it the Express. And Anita, Anita worked with getting it organized, her and uh, Deanna Wilkinson. Deanna Wilkinson was super fine player and uh, singer. Cause he leaned over to me and he says, that, who's that young woman singing at 1981? He says, that the young woman she was talking about that they threw acid on? I said, yes. He said, I bet that's right. He said, I bet it's 1981. I said, the 19, he said, I bet by 1981, Comrade Jim Jones, he calls me, Comrade Jim Jones. He says, I, I'll bet people, people won't be able to pass freely out of USA or in USA by 1981. He said, I like that song. It's a sad song, but I like that song. 
at the end went up to her face. Oh, there was all this, you know, Jim would come up with this story. Oh, yeah, some racist threw shit in her face or something. I think she probably got burned when she was a baby or something. You know, yeah, one of, the, one of those accidental things where, you know, a hot pot falls off a stove and, it, and the poor kid gets in the way and there you are. I think that's really what happened. Jim Jones, he said anything at the moment that served his purpose, whether it was related to the truth or not, I think she suffered from an accident. That, uh, that the scars on her face were the result of an accident when she was just a, a little kid. He loved to lie. He, he loved, he just, he, he loved, he was, and he was always doing it. So, um, yeah, he said that about her, but, you know, I, she, she never once mentioned anything like that. And uh, the only, she, the, my, my recollection is that the only thing she talked about was that happened when she was a real little girl. Let me tell you something about Diana. She had some serious talent. I mean, she was professional caliber uh, musician and singer. She was incredible. She was a nasty little shit, but she had talent. She had real talent. Loretta Cordell, or Loretta Cordell was unappreciated too. She was really good on that band organ. Diana was having an affair with Loretta Cordell. Uh, and they were they were together a lot. They were they were together a lot. They were, uh, but she, boy, she could sing. God damn, and she could play. She was, she was just, uh, just extraordinary. Rebecca Moore once said, after the temple moved to Guyana, they were in many respects no longer a religious organization, and was instead a socialist utopian experiment. The Jonestown Express, the choir, the African dancers and the many talents that graced the stage in the pavilion in Jonestown connected the settlers to the outside world, reminded them of home, and filled long, hot jungle nights with music. The lyrics to the songs may have changed, but the spirit of the performers, as you can hear in Deanna Wilkinson's voice on November 17, 1978, remained unbroken. Everything has its uh, has its meaning to each individual. Uh, some of these songs are kind of cathartic for myself, you know, and uh, maybe we'll be up the road. But I just believe it took a few years to understand it because after that first happened for about the first three years, I was so resentful over my dad putting his family in that kind of situation when he knew better. And then I was upset at myself for participating in something that helped promote that along the way. But once it's done, it is done. And uh, I look at it now, realizing that you cannot preach to somebody about being involved in something like that until they personally realize that you shouldn't or it's going to be a problem. I mean, you can say it all you want, but that don't mean it's, it, you know, uh, it's going to stick. Because if people aren't looking for an answer, you're not going to get one. It's my opinion, uh, when you get to a point in your life where you have nothing that still inspires you, you're not long to be here. On November 18, 1978, Jack's family died in Jonestown. He lost his father, mother, and his sister, Ellie. Fortunately, Jack's sister, Joyce, survived. That fateful day also claimed the lives of Mike Wood's entire family. The lives of Deanna Wilkinson, Loretta Cordell, Shirley Smith, Ruth Coleman, Richard Tropp, and most of the choir and children's choir. Far too many names to name here. On December 5th, 1978, racked with grief and struggling to make sense of the tragedy, Jack Arnold began writing lyrics to a song that would eventually be lost and forgotten for 42 years. In October 2020, Jack unearthed these lyrics while sorting through papers nearly destroyed in a flood. Throughout his life, Jack has continued to work on his music, developing his sound and working with talented musicians. These days, Jack works alone in his home studio. Shortly after discovering these lyrics, Jack wrote and recorded the song, using the lyrics that reflected his thoughts and feelings at the time, just after the tragedy. Jack generously shared the song with me and now I'd like to share it with you. 
Father Knows Best by Jack Arnold Beam. Father Knows Best, let him be your bright tomorrow. He'll fill your heart with joy and comfort you in sorrow. Father knows best, trust his gifts of knowledge and truth. Your brotherhood dream will come true if you do. Father's love will always take care of you. My family drink the poison and die, begging them not to complain. Brian's life had been stuffed down, then father killed all his friends. Only little purple hell survived that day in a bucket with the cold syringe. Attention Span Recovery Project would like to thank our special guests for this episode, Jack Beam, Mike Wood, and Laura Johnston Cole. 
We would also like to thank the Jonestown Institute, otherwise known as the Alternative Considerations of Jonestown and People's Temple. Their website can be found at jonestown.sdsu.edu. The Attention Span Recovery Project would like to thank you for listening. And remember, never give up on your dreams. Without them, you're only asleep. Unfortunately, we will not be announcing when the next episode will be out. Please check back with us. You can't find gas. Now they want us to take off the gas. End transmission. Yes, that's Millie Jackson coming at you right here under the starlights. If you got enough room in your belly, go down and down some of that jelly because coming up next is Rick James and you and I. Come on. All farm members are to be here at 9 in the morning. Our choir dresses, please bring iron and ironing board, everyone that's available. All choir members that are available be here in the morning at 9 o'clock. Bring iron and ironing board to iron choir dresses. How many will be here, choir members? How many choir members will be here? This is ridiculous. I have to go through this now. How many will be here? How many will be here to help iron? Remember, there's, a little, there's one member that's not here today because they didn't keep my saying yesterday. So yes, that was vision by the hit group, the Commodores, because we dancing so bright, we getting down under the starlights right here on top of the hill with J.J. Tumbles getting down and J. So coming at you is the hit from the silvers, sweating for you, baby, come on.